Hey everyone, and welcome to our webinar. With consumers across the globe facing a cost of living crisis, we're going to focus on the state of the US and some of the major issues that Americans are facing when it comes to managing their health and wellness. But before we dive in, allow us to quickly introduce ourselves. My name is Tom, and I'm a trends analyst on the trends team based in GWI's London office. And I'm also joined by my colleague Moana, who's a senior trends analyst here at GWI based in New York. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. So before we dive into the data, we're just gonna give you a quick overview of who we are for anyone who might not know us. GWI is a target audience company and we provide consumer insights to leading brands, marketing agencies, and media organizations worldwide. We're home to the largest study in the digital consumer, which is made available through our intuitive subscription-based platform which allows teams to dive in and cross-analyze different data points and audiences. We've got the world's biggest panel of respondents, with over 22 million panelists in 50 countries conducting over a million interviews every year. So it's safe to say we've got a pretty well-rounded view of global audiences. But as we've mentioned, today we're not focused on global trends, we're narrowing the lens on the US market and we have a data set that empowers us to do just that. In the US, we cover over 50 states and we have 210 designated market areas. Our US survey has a quarterly sample of 20,000 or 80,000 annually, which equates to roughly 240 million connected consumers. So what this means is that we're really able to tap into the US consumer across a wide range of demographic backgrounds. Our USA survey is filled with a really broad range of categories, so we not only get to ask questions about attitudes and interests, but we can also dive deeper into consumer needs across multiple industries. Our questionnaire content is tailored to the American market, while the sample encompasses a broader range of internet users by age. Our survey also contains a set of multicultural questions shown only to Hispanic, Black, African American, and Asian American respondents. But for a bit of housekeeping, in today's webinar, you'll hear us make references to consumer demographics, predominantly looking by urban rural context and income. For low-income Americans, we're referring to households earning less than $50,000 per annum. For medium income, earnings are between $50,000 and less than $100,000. And finally, household earnings over $100,000 are high income. And taking a closer look at our data, you'll hear us refer to index or likelihood scores, which compare how much more or less a like an audience member matches an attribute in relation to a base audience or average. This gives us a better understanding of what makes different groups in the US stand out. So enough of the intros. Let's start things off by taking a look at the general healthcare landscape in the US and how Americans are feeling. So we've likely all heard about healthcare in the US perhaps about how expensive it is or the lack of universal coverage it provides. These opinions are shared by many, as 47% of American consumers say they worry about the quality and cost of healthcare they receive. But to put it into context, according to the World Health Organization's Global Expenditure Report, we know that the US accounts for a whopping 40% of all global health spending. On top of that, not only is the US health spending per capita double that of other similarly developed countries, the performance of the system also ranks last when compared to 10 other high income countries. And when it comes to who is most concerned about healthcare cost and quality, we can see baby boomers lead the way. Even though we're not living longer, we're seeing waves of lifestyle conditions emerge, with baby boomers experiencing higher rates of hypertension, high cholesterol, obesity and diabetes. Treatment for such illnesses are not only costly, but require recurring long-term care. Though emerging seniors tend to approach healthcare expenses as their personal responsibility, the cost is simply too great for many to handle, as anticipated expenses outstrip what many retirees have in their savings for what should be considered their golden years. Our Q2 2020 data here really captures the overwhelming worry that American consumers felt about infectious diseases and viruses during the early days of the pandemic, 
when they hit their peak of 58%. Fast forward to today, among many consumers, the fear still lingers. Despite the gradual loosening of restrictions, not everyone is comfortable getting back out and socializing to the same degree. Current concern about infectious diseases among baby boomers is higher than any peak felt by Gen Z or millennials, as they are 25% more likely to worry about infectious diseases than the average consumer. Even among Gen X, the level of concern has been below baby boomers' current level since Q4 of 2020. So it doesn't come as a surprise that along with fearing infectious diseases, 65% of baby boomers believe another pandemic is likely to happen during their lifetime. But despite the fear of viruses and an overall decline in perceived health, older consumers actually worry the least. Just 15% of baby boomers say they frequently worry about their personal health, compared to 23% of Gen Z. As one of the youngest age cohorts coping with the pandemic, the concerns of Gen Z are a bit different than those of their old generations. While older people are more susceptible to the complications from COVID-19, it's actually the younger generations like Gen Z that have shown feelings of good health declining throughout the pandemic. As you can see from the chart, 83% of Gen Z said they're in good or excellent health in Q2 2020. This figure reduced to 76% in Q2 2022, the most of any generation. It may come as a surprise when you factor in other things such as their increased likelihood to track their health, wear smartwatches, and being more inclined to say they struggle with anxiety or stress, the narrative begins to make sense. As we look at quality of health, issues that many face in the US come to light. Income, ethnicity, urban or rural living, and education level all have an effect on quality of health. For Americans, health inequalities driven by factors both inside and outside the healthcare system are common. But as consumers face rising living costs, it's the vulnerable who are more likely to suffer. As people from high income backgrounds, urban environments, and those educated to a degree level or higher all have higher perceived quality of health, with all data points being above the US average of 78%. Whereas low income households are far more likely to say that they have long term conditions, such as backache or pain and high blood pressure, and short term conditions like insomnia. In fact, low-income households are 31% more likely than average to experience insomnia regularly or often, and 29% more likely to suffer from back, muscle, or joint pain compared to the average American. And for many, these disparities in health have long been the norm due to issues around cost and access to healthcare. Decades of failed policies have led to structural economic suppression unequal education access and urban segregation, all of which are contributing in their own ways to worse health outcomes. And if you look at the US average on the chart compared to each demographic, the story begins to speak for itself. Now, if you're tuning in live today, US inflation is at a 40 year high and it's making consumers think twice when it comes to their day to day activities. The danger for vulnerable consumers, to those with less purchasing power and healthcare access, is they're less likely to consult a doctor or a healthcare professional or visit a doctor or nurse when they're feeling unwell. When taking those factors into consideration, it doesn't come as a surprise that in comparison to high income consumers, low income consumers are far more likely to struggle with long term conditions, which often don't receive adequate treatment and evolve into lifelong side effects. Sometimes these side effects are more detrimental than the long-term condition itself. For low earners with long-term conditions, 42% struggle with sleep issues, and they are 34% more likely than average to experience issues with self-confidence. Taking a step back and understanding why low-income consumers are increasingly more susceptible to side effects from long-term conditions involves analyzing the external social economic inequalities that drive health disparities. Lack of economic stability, like unemployment, high expenses, or debt can lead to minimal or lack of health coverage, which in turn causes conditions to remain untreated and become perpetually worse. In turn, one could be employed but live in a healthcare desert where they lack transportation to see a specific provider 
or visit a specific pharmacy preventing access to treatment. It's a difficult but unavoidable situation for many Americans, especially low earners, where a single doctor's visit can be a real financial obstacle. Throughout the year, many will pay hundreds or thousands of dollars in premiums. At the doctor's office, they're faced with a deductible and may need to pay co-insurance or make a co-payment. If they have prescriptions, that's an additional added cost too. And that's just for basic primary care for one person. Repeat that process for an entire family. Add any labs, referrals, specialists, emergency room visits and surgeries. And the result for even healthy families can often be thousands of dollars. With that in mind, it will come of little surprise that low income consumers are 15% more likely to consider the cost of medical treatments, only emphasizing the huge dilemmas vulnerable Americans face when it comes to managing their health. But even with all the inequalities within the US healthcare system in the last few years, digital access has started to drive health equality. Whether it's using an online patient portal to access medical records, virtual therapy appointments, or comparing prices of drugs, medicine, or health services, digital health tools are extremely beneficial as they increase healthcare access, can address unmet needs through personalized care and support underserved communities. In the past two years, our data has shown a significant increase in consumers engaging in online healthcare behaviors, suggesting they've become more comfortable with the idea, especially older generations. With 39% of baby boomers saying they've refilled a prescription online and 33% saying they've accessed electronic medical records through an online patient portal. It's important to note the pandemic had an immense and long lasting impact on driving the growth of digital health tools. And there are definitely no signs of it slowing down anytime soon. So now we've got an idea of the general health landscape now we're going to take a look at managing mental health in the US in 2022. See, managing mental health is growing in importance among consumers as many seats can take control of their own health in the wake of the pandemic. To gauge American sentiment, we can take search interest as a pretty good indication of just how they're feeling. Google search interest in mental health peaked in the US this year, and there's a growing demand for greater access to mental health providers, as searches for mental health support also topped out. Some of the most striking examples of health disparities are shown by looking at consumers' health conditions by income and urban and rural context. We briefly touched on this earlier, but from conditions like joint pain to nasal congestion, hay fever to skin irritations, nearly all the health conditions we tracked in the US are more prevalent among rural and low income communities. In the context of mental health, low earners are over 16% more likely to have suffered from anxiety and around 15% more likely to have suffered from depression in the last year compared to urban consumers. It's important to raise awareness about these issues, but also to help show how brands can reach those who need support the most. That's right. And as we mentioned earlier, digital healthcare has made healthcare accessible from the comfort of your home. Despite this, low-income Americans are less likely to use these online tools. If we take a closer look at Americans who suffer from the mental health conditions cha or challenges mentioned on the previous slide, low earners are 13% less likely to have used an online patient portal to access electronic medical records or to refill a prescription. Now, the figures are striking, but it's not due to low earners' lack of online activity. For low earners, Mobile phones are the one-stop shop for all their online activities. They're more likely to own a mobile phone than a PC, laptop, or tablet, and the average user spends an extra 40 minutes on their phone a day. If you compare their phone usage to high earners, low earners spend an extra 45 minutes a day on their phones, while the more affluent group favors spending their time on non-mobile devices. These figures highlight a huge opportunity and a positive sign for mental health app market. A market that is estimated to reach 17.5 billion by 2030. Focusing on mobile friendly mental health apps and importantly, raising awareness about these tools can help vulnerable Americans to access resources that state infrastructure or private health services alone may struggle to provide. 
there needs to be a process of further educating Americans about digital healthcare. But it's important to note that this is by no means intended as a replacement for in-person support, rather a tool to make resources accessible to all Americans when they need it the most. But in the US, low earners and rural communities aren't the only groups that stand out for their mental health struggles. In fact, the US as a whole stands out from the rest of the world for its struggles in the workplace. Our April Zeitgeist data shows that in nine market studies, US workers face the highest levels of burnout and being overworked. And as you can see from the slides, levels are around two and a half times higher than in Germany or Japan. What's even more alarming is that they're also the least comfortable talking about their mental health. In the US, three in 10 workers say they're uncomfortable talking about their mental health in the workplace. And that's not all. Workers also stand out the most as they are 36% more likely to experience workload pressure and 27% more likely to struggle with work-life balance. It's why when comparing full-time workers to the average US internet user, these work-related concerns sit above the country average. They stand out even further as career uncertainty and financial strain are actually below the US average when it comes to the issues they're currently facing, although they are still significant. In fact, the US added 528,000 jobs in July, an indication of resilience despite signs of slowing economic growth and rising inflation. So what role does the employer play in this scenario? And what is it that employees want? Well, using our GWI work data, we know that employees that provide benefits like mental health support are more likely to have satisfied workers. Not only that, but it may even lead to greater retention, as employees with these benefits are less likely to say they're looking for a new job. Now, it's fair to say that if you're an employer, you probably want to retain your best talent. And now offering mental health support is no longer an exception, but an expectation. And that's exactly the view of the American worker, with work-related stress made worse by the pressures they're facing when it comes to their day-to-day -day life. In the last three months, 76% of full-time workers say they've been price conscious about food or groceries, and 53% are price conscious about the cost of transportation. For many Americans, that might mean swapping out the trip to a drive through during their daily commute to work for a tumbler and a packed lunch on public transportation instead. The key for employers is to put the mental health of their workforce front and center, offering them tangible benefits. Running a workshop once a year or offering free cakes and the staff from a canteen is not enough in isolation. These things should be ingrained in the day-to-day -day working culture of the company. And as the chart shows, 57% of American workers want the opportunity for mental well-being leave or days off should they need it. See, the pandemic ripped up the rule book when it comes to working practices. You can see from the slide, three of the top four things employees want are to do with flexibility. Flexibility in working days, flexibility in working hours, and flexibility in working location. But employers do heed some caution, because flexibility isn't for everyone as a third of US workers agree that working from home makes their work-life boundaries unclear. So it's not just about giving the workers the option to work from home and start early, but also to head into the office should they want to. So now we've had a look at the general health landscape and mental well-being. We want to take a look at the dilemmas Americans face with exercise and fitness. Pretty much everyone knows the benefits of exercise, right? not just for physical health, but for mental health too. But something that's perhaps less talked about is access. Not everyone has the ability to stay active, even if they want to. Many Americans live in areas with poor sidewalk and street infrastructures, as well as lack of safe places to exercise. Wherever there are community opportunities for physical exercise, they may have not been built with all possible users in mind such as older residents or those with impairments. But for consumers with greater buying power, they often have more opportunities to access a better quality of life generally. This means living in more expensive neighborhoods with greater amenities, being close to their jobs and buying the latest sports equipment when it's available. 
It goes some way to explaining why those in lower income households are less likely to say they work out, go to the gym, and are less likely to run, even when on the surface, these activities might seem accessible. The issues have to do with the fundamental sources of inequality, which for many are clear to see. It's not just a question of throwing money at it and hoping that exercise becomes accessible. Rather, it would take collaboration across sectors, including public health, transportation, planning and beyond, to create a country where everyone has access to safe and convenient opportunities to be physically active. And we don't just see fitness and exercise disparities among adults. Kids are just as likely to be impacted too. Our research shows that kids from low-income households are much less likely to be playing sports regularly in comparison to kids from high-income households. Why, you may ask? Well, a lot of changes as kids transition from elementary to secondary school. And among those changes is how they participate in sports. For our younger cohort, sport is less regular and is supplemented through gym class and unstructured play at recess. As they enter middle school, the National Association for Sport and Physical Education guidelines for recess shrink from 20 minutes per day to nothing. This hole in physical activity is expected to be filled through organized sports, both through school and club teams, leading to more consistency and play outside of school hours. The issue arises when the cost of club and school sports continues to skyrocket with expenses like league fees, camps, equipment, travel, and training. For kids from low-income households, gym class is one of the few places they have to fulfill their potential. Now, as we've already talked about digital healthcare, we're gonna keep on the theme. As the introduction of new technology enters the health realm, barriers to participation are slowly deconstructing, as seen with smartwatches, which not only allow consumers to track the steps per day, to take health into their own hands. Smartwatches are a key driver of health equity, as consumers are easily able to access vital health metrics like heart rate, to more sophisticated measures like blood pressure and respiratory rate, information they might have only received through a routine doctor's visit at a fraction of the price. Initially, high-income Americans were the early adopters in this space, but now, ownership of smartwatches isn't just a wealthy or young consumer's game. Since Q2 2020, low-income Americans have seen the fastest growth in ownership of all income segments, with nearly one in three now owning a smartwatch. Older consumers, who are more vulnerable and concerned about their healthcare costs, are embracing these technologies to better understand their health. And it's no wonder they've become increasingly popular across all ages, as innovations in personalized health technology provide a unique opportunity to develop connected healthcare models that are built around the patient's individual needs. Digital healthcare tools remove the barrier of access. Whether that barrier be physical, say a consumer is located in a provider desert with lack of transportation, or financially, where even an annual checkup could cause major financial strain. The data they receive from apps or wearable technology lead to discovering that overall health is the sum of all the small choices you make each day from what you eat, to how much you move, to how much you sleep. Sports apps like Strava allow you to track your activities for free and compare them against millions of other active users, as well as provide useful metrics around your health and heart rate. Not only are they providing you with important health information, but built-in support network with other users that have the potential to further encourage fitness and health regimes. The rise of digital healthcare technology is giving consumers opportunity to take control of their health, especially at a time where the cost of living crisis is putting pressure on many consumers' finances, which might be at the detriment of their health. So, we've covered a lot of topics today. We're going to close things out by looking at Americans' diets and nutrition in an economic downturn. See, since the cost of living crisis really started gripping consumers at the start of the year, we've been keeping tabs on how consumers are feeling about their spending. So we first checked in to see how consumers are feeling in March. At the time, 16% of Americans said they were thinking about spending less on groceries or household products. In April, we checked again to see the kind of things consumers are price conscious about. At the time, 
68% of Americans said they were conscious about the price of food and groceries. Now, finally, in July, we asked again to see what American consumers have been most price conscious about over the last three months. This time, a whopping 77% said food or groceries. Now, the most alarming stat that is in 13 global markets studied, including Canada, the UK, Singapore, and Australia, the US ranks above them all. This is second when it comes to grocery spending concerns. You can draw a few conclusions from these figures. Of course, there's a difference between what consumers think will help and the roles of my actions. But the overwhelming story is that something as fundamental as food is putting pressure on a large percentage of American spending. As patterns of spending change amongst Americans, so do diets, as they can be a pretty good indication of Americans' lifestyles. They're a reflection of their surroundings, and the differences are seen when looking at demographics by income and rural contexts. Compared to low earners, high earners are 14% less likely to say they are overweight or obese. But urban context has even greater differences as rural Americans are 24% more likely to say they're obese or overweight than their urban living counterparts. If we look at the reasons for choosing to diet, some of these differences are really clear. Low earners stand out for dieting to manage health-related issues, like controlling hypertension or blood sugar levels. Medium and high earners see their dietary choices reflecting a more leisurely lifestyle, with dieting reasons such as losing weight, feeling healthy, and improving fitness. While it begins to explain their reasons for dieting, we need to know more about the food or groceries that Americans are buying. Now, with our USA data set, we also ask consumers about their food purchase decisions to better understand the things that are important to them when it comes to buying groceries. As you can see from the chart on the screen, Americans look out for products that are natural or made in the US. But that's not the biggest story at play. Although the percentage changed on the slide may give you some indication, 17 of the 21 food attitudes we track declined in importance over the last 12 months. It's an average decrease of 4% across all 21 attitudes surveyed. But to put it simply, Americans in 2022 are less picky about the food they're buying from the shops than they were during the pandemic. But there are, however, some interesting trends by income that begin to show that it's less of an issue of education about what food is healthy but more of an issue of access. See, when buying food, the number of low-income Americans who think animal welfare standards are important has grown 11% year on year. There's also been an increase in the number who think high-protein products, low-carb products, products with nutritional benefits, and sustainable or eco-friendly products are important. Now, high earners, on the other hand, have actually seen some of the biggest downturns in interest when it comes to the food they buy. The number who think sustainable or eco-friendly products are important has dropped 10%. And it's the same figure for organic products too. There was even a drop of 18% for consumers who think fat-free products are important. So Americans are less interested in the food they're buying. But it's low earners that have seen the lowest decline in interest and the highest growth, while high earners have seen the biggest declines across all income segments. The issues around access surround both the availability of healthy foods in an area, as well as the issue of consumer purchasing power. The pandemic resulted in the sharpest annual decline in the share of disposable income on food since the U.S. Department of Agriculture began tracking these costs. Current rates of inflation are spiraling prices upwards, which looks to only further affect those whose wallets are already tightening. Since Q2 2021, there's been a decline in the number of Americans saying they eat healthily, as well as growth in consumers who say they eat meat and have no plans to change. It may come as a slightly alarming sign, but of course, this is taking trends at the population level. So let's have a look under the skin of 2022 America. Rural Americans are far more likely to eat meat and have no plans to change than urban Americans. And it's the same trend for low earners too. According to the USDA, meat products have seen some of the highest growth in costs of all food categories tracked, while fruit and vegetables managed to stay more in line with the expected rates of inflation. 
Research from the University of Oxford also shows that eating a plant-based diet can cut household food bills by up to a third, even in developed economies such as the US. So plant-based diets not only have the potential for better health and environmental outcomes, but economic outcomes for consumers too. There needs to be more involvement from brands to help reach out in rural communities to make healthy food choices an option for all Americans and not just those who can buy their way to healthier lifestyles. So to round up, we're just going to leave you with a few key takeaways. To start, digital healthcare is starting to drive health equity. It could be using online portals to access medical records, or comparing the price of drugs or medicines, but wider adoption is only going to help support underserved communities. This is also the case of mental health, as these services can help to reach the hard to reach, giving them access to support should they need it. Now, as a timely segue, as mental health is a major issue in the US, especially in the workplace. Now, it's not enough for employers to offer mental health support as a workplace perk, as many employees now see it as an expectation. Having flexible working arrangements and allowing time away from work to focus on mental health are just some of the measures employers can take to support their workforce. Next, we looked at fitness and exercise. We know that exercise has benefits for physical and mental well-being, but systemic issues mean even exercise that seems accessible, like running or going to the gym, is less prevalent among rural and low-income communities. These inequalities exist not just among kids, not just among adults, but kids too, highlighting the long-term negative effects many Americans are burdened with. And finally, Compared to similarly developed nations like the UK, Canada, Australia, the US has some of the highest levels of concern when it comes to affording groceries. Americans are becoming less picky about the food they buy, but while low earners stand out for choosing to diet to manage existing health conditions, high earners stand out for dieting to manage their lifestyle. That said, reducing meat consumption or stopping eating meat entirely can reduce the cost of groceries for consumers, but low earners are the least likely to be interested in doing so. So that's all from us today. We thank you all very much for listening. If you have any questions about what you've seen, or you'd like more information about what we do here at GWI, please don't hesitate to reach out to us on the email address on the screen. We also have a host of free content available on our website, so if you've enjoyed what you've heard, head over to gwi.com and click on the resources tab to find out more. Thank you all for joining today. We'll be sending you recording and slides from this webinar so you can look over today's content in your own time. Thanks everyone.